Hey everybody, welcome back. I have another video for you. So much to discuss as always. Let's jump right into it. Let me do my usual uh, promotion. Go over to Patreon. If you're seeing a free video now, go to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Eric Dreitzer. All my videos are there. All my writings are there. All of my uh, everything is available there. And I uh, really appreciate those of you who have been supporting me. Truly independent political analysis is not so easy to find these days, especially with all of the absolute garbage that you find online. So for those of you who are supporting me, thank you so much. For those of you considering it, thank you so much. For those of you absolutely rejecting it, I, I don't know, screw you. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, let's jump into it. Um, Counterpunch also, by the way, counterpunch.org. Go over, get a Counterpunch Plus subscription. That would be wonderful. Okay, let's talk about what's going on in Ukraine right now. There was an election here in the United States. I'm not going to discuss it. Other people can discuss that. Let's talk about what's happening in Ukraine and in Russia. Uh, right now, the big story, the story that I want to spend most of my time talking about is the uh, Russian retreat from Kherson and what it actually means, why it's happening, what we can glean about the situation from this. Again, I mean, you're not going to get the Kremlin line from me, and you're not going to get Washington's line from me. If you want the actual analysis, you have to look at what's really happening. Okay, plenty of other people are going to give you all this Putin bullshit, but that's not here. So let's talk about what Russia's really doing. They are definitely withdrawing from Kherson. What their motivations are, um, maybe not as clear, but we'll discuss. So, oh, and by the way, you see this guy over here, over my shoulder? That's a guy named Lenin. Uh, I've recently returned to a lot of his writings about Ukraine, about the right of nations to self-determination and so forth. And it is amazing how much of the current conflict was written about by Lenin a hundred plus years ago. And it reminds us again of the importance of remembering that this war is an explicitly anti-communist war, explicitly so. Putin launched the war the invasion of Ukraine with an explicitly anti-Lenin, anti-Bolshevik, anti-communist speech in which he, I think correctly, attributed many of the problems of Ukraine to Lenin, who a hundred plus years ago wrote about the importance of allowing the people of Ukraine to determine their own fate and not to subject them to the yoke of great Russian chauvinism. So I would just recommend for everybody go back and read Lenin on the right of nations to self-determination. And you can see him a hundred plus years ago, debunking almost all of Russia's absolute disgusting propaganda about Ukraine. Anyway, so anyway, I thought I'd have him join me today. All right, let's do a quick status report. Russia is retreating from Kherson. Uh, Defense Minister Shoigu has recently ordered the withdrawal of all equipment and personnel uh, from the right bank of the Dnipro River, which is the western bank, to the left bank, which is the eastern bank. In other words, directly out of the city of Kherson and onto a more defensible position. Shoigu has made this uh, order of withdrawal on the recommendation of the uh, Russian commander of forces in Ukraine, General Sorovikin. Um, and, uh, you know, he's one of the many disposable generals that we've seen throughout this war on the Ge uh, Russian general merry-go-round, and he's the latest. So he reported, and it was carried, I think, live on Russian television. He reported to uh, you know the leadership there that uh, under the current conditions, the resupply of Kherson is impossible for Russia. So he recommended that Russia now shift its position to what he what what he called a more defensible position. In other words, out of the city proper and onto the other bank, the other side of the river. Now, obviously, this is an anticipation. And I'm going to talk about this in a second. This is an anticipation of the Ukrainians recapturing the entire city. OK, so basically his point is let's not get trapped in Kherson as the Ukrainians try to encircle us and destroy us and rout our forces. Let's move our people to the other side of the river. Let's settle into our defenses and let's once again create a sort of a semi frozen battle of attrition like they've done countless times before. The Russians obviously feel that plays to their strengths and that's what they are doing here. So. Uh, Surovikin and, and Russian propaganda has kind of presented all of this as a retreat to save lives. 
Okay, they they make the claim that Russia's primary focus is the uh, is the preservation of the lives of its soldiers and secondarily of the civilian population. Um, that is more or less what the reasoning was publicly. Uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, the uh, the brutal tyrant dictator in uh, Chechnya, he more or less has agreed with this with with this recommendation he wrote it on his telegram channel that's interesting considering the fact that kadyrov has been one of the more vocal opponents of some of the moves that have been made by russia's military and especially uh presenting himself as you know to the right of vladimir putin on a lot of these issues so what does it actually mean okay what does all of this mean Obviously, there are military reasons behind this. There are plenty of things that could be uh, looked at and discussed. But I would just point out that um, one of the primary issues really is about control of the entire region. The retreat from Kherson basically means that the Russians control none of the Mikolaev region. In other words, it is almost entirely under the control of uh, Ukraine. Russia controls about 4% of the region currently today. Um, the head of the Mikolaev region is very skeptical of the idea that the Russians are really going to retreat from Kherson. He uh, is quoted in Medusa's article, quote, if Russians say one thing, it means they'll do the opposite. He has a point. The Russians absolutely do have a tendency to do exactly the opposite of what they say. The question is, can such a maneuver like withdrawing from a major city, can that simply be reversed? I mean, the answer is obviously no. So the question is just how uh, apparent is this withdrawal? I suppose time will tell. Uh, so the uh, advisor to Zelensky, Mikhailo Podolyak, said, quote, until the Ukrainian flag flies over Kherson, it makes no sense to talk about a Russian retreat. Well, for political consumption, I can understand that. But for those of us trying to ascertain what's happening, it's clear that we can talk about a Russian retreat and why this might be happening. So the reports right now are that the Russians have blown at least five bridges leading to the uh, to the right bank of, of, uh, of the river, leading directly into Kherson. The idea, of course, being that the Russians are blowing the bridges for the purposes of slowing down the Ukrainian uh, offensive against their positions and also making it more difficult to do anything other than kind of this attrition style war with one on one side of the river and the other on the other side. Uh, so we... I think it's fair to say that this is both slowing the Ukrainian advance and allowing time to uh, buying time for a retreat. Right. So the Russians are definitely retreating and they're clearly trying to buy time in order to do so in the most effective way possible. Now, there are a number of other things that we have to consider here as well. Uh, the Ukrainians have promised to recapture the entire region. Okay, that means, of course, not just the city of Kherson, but all of Mikolaev, including the position that the Russians are holding currently. So uh, it raises also the question about these annexations. Remember that it was only a month and a half ago, a month and a half ago, that uh, that Putin formally annexed Zaporizhia and Kherson and Lugansk and Donetsk. Okay, and now the Russians control none of them. That is to say, they don't they, they haven't consolidated control over any of those regions. So it remains an open question. What do the annexations mean if Russia is not going to actually defend the territory that they claim to be Russian territory? Then does the annexation mean anything at all? Was it just a political stunt designed to bolster Putin's position heading into a negotiation, it remains an open question. Um, a lot, a lot more to say. Let's just talk about what, um, well, okay. The Kremlin, according to sources inside of the Kremlin, the Kremlin ordered uh, the Russian propaganda machine to really whip up some, uh, manufacture some consent for this retreat from Kherson. Remember that the, the Russians had claimed that they would never leave Andrei Turchak, secretary of the General Council of the United Russia, he went to Kherson in May and said, quote, Russia is here forever. Okay, that's what he said in May. 
Six and a half months later, the Russians are gone. How do we how do we view what has transpired as anything other than a Russian defeat? That's clearly what has happened here. Okay, now this is a problem for Putin, something that he is going to have to address, especially with regard to those on his right who are chattering endlessly on Telegram about these failures. Uh, let's see. Let's remember that Kherson is the only city the Russians held, and now they don't hold it anymore. They got it in the very early stages of the war in March of 2022. They've held it since then, and now they have lost it. So there's another interesting story that needs to be covered here. Um, on November 9th, so yesterday, uh, Russia's Russia's uh, hand-chosen proxy leader for Kherson was found dead. Kirill Stremusov, killed in a car accident. Boy, I'm sure that's just a coincidence. I'm sure that Russia's puppet governor dies on the very same day that Russia announces a withdrawal, and it's totally, totally, totally a coincidence. Let's talk about some uh, atrocities, shall we? What's going to come out of Kherson now that the Russians have left? If it's anything remotely close to what came out of places like Izum and Bucha, once the Russians left, I think we could get a pretty good sense of what kind of atrocities we're going to hear about. Again, sexual violence across the board, mass killings, mass graves, uh, you, you know, all of the most horrible things you can imagine that absolutely did happen in the uh, suburbs of Kiev, in the um, uh, uh, areas around Mariupol and all of the other places where the Russians have been. This is what happens. This is what we will undoubtedly hear about happen having happened in Kherson as well. So ultimately, what do we want to say about this? We, we, we basically can say that the Russians are now desperately trying to spin the retreat as merely a tactical withdrawal, just as every power that loses a battle tries to do. The reality, though, is that this is now creating a much different scenario on the ground, one in which the Ukrainians may now actually be forced to reevaluate their prior position about negotiating with Russia and with Putin. Um, this kind of gets us into a couple of other uh, articles, and I'm going to just point out that this has been reported in a number of different places. The Wall Street Journal had a good piece on this. The Guardian had a good piece on it. But ultimately, the story is that the Biden administration is now really leaning on Zelensky and his government to come back to the negotiating table. They're obviously aware of everything that's transpired, including the fact that uh, Zelensky signed a decree, a presidential decree saying that Ukraine will not negotiate un unless and until there is new leadership in Russia. Yeah, well, guess what? Washington is the one with the with with the firepower, not Ukraine. Washington is the one that can dictate to Ukraine. Unfortunately, this is the reality of the world we live in, where might makes right and power allows one to dictate to smaller countries what they can and can't do. Now, I, I personally am of the opinion that negotiation is, is absolutely good. I think that we are in a very dangerous uh, situation where things can spin out of control well beyond Ukraine, including famine, including wars in other parts of the world and uh, increasing threat of global conflict and obviously the nuclear issue is you know sort of goes without saying so does i guess this is a long way of me saying does the retreat from Kherson change facts on the ground enough that we have potentially an opening for a negotiation we definitely have seen biden's top advisor jake sullivan uh on the phones now that's been like i said reported in the wall street journal with the top leadership and top advisors to putin so it's clear that the united states is making those overtures at least to the extent of you know trying to probe for possible avenues of negotiation now the point being here that Biden talking directly to the Russians 
counter sort of counteracts a lot of the propaganda, the 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 mainstream liberal propaganda in particular regarding you know uh, you, the United States observing Ukraine's sovereignty and independence and not trying to dictate to Ukraine what it can and can't do. That's of course nonsense. The other thing that I uh, the other thing that's very interesting here is that Biden's direct negotiation or Biden's people directly negotiating with the Russians is pretty embarrassing for those progressive Democrats who had withdrawn that letter calling on the Biden administration to do precisely that. So they withdrew the letter because of the, you know, sort of uh, uh, backlash that it engendered from the warmongering camp, which is most of our elected officials. And, uh, and then a couple of days later, Wall Street Journal turns around and reports that Biden's already doing what it is that they were too embarrassed to publicly stand by. So this is... I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to make this about something other than Ukraine because this is really about Ukraine. But this, I think, goes to show you just how unbelievably spineless most of the uh, so-called left progressive uh, elected officials in the United States are. They have absolutely no connection to a legitimate peace movement or to any sort of call for peace. They are more or less self-serving politicians, as we would expect. So um, in any event, I think Rohana had said that he did stand by uh, having signed that letter, but many others did not. So in any event, the question, and it's been asked by many, is does do, do we now enter into a new phase where negotiations can happen, real negotiations? It's possible. It certainly would be a very charitable interpretation of what Putin has been doing to say that, you know, the withdrawal to hear some is some kind of a goodwill gesture designed to sort of assure people of the good faith negotiating efforts of Russia, et cetera. Who knows? Who knows? But that opening is there. And if we can manage to find a way to the negotiating table where the uh, uh, territory that is Ukrainian is returned to Ukraine in exchange for, I don't know what, formal recognition of Crimea, r- removal of sanctions, amnesty uh, against any war crimes charges, maybe some kind of uh, uh, power sharing arrangement, maybe some sort of uh, written guarantees with respect to NATO, with respect to NATO troops, forward positions, who knows, right? There's all kinds of possibilities, but ultimately the question is really going to come come to what the Russians are, and Putin specifically, are prepared to accept, and what are they prepared to come back to Russia and try to spin as a victory? Right now, the Russians have really painted themselves into a corner. This is what I've been saying all along. Putin has blundered from one blunder to the next, and anybody who thinks he's playing some kind of 12-dimensional chess or something is ridiculous and, 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 and completely detached from reality. Putin is blundering. Putin painted himself into a corner. He should have never announced those annexations. By announcing the annexations, you have announced that that territory belongs to you. And guess what happens? When that territory belongs to you and you lose and retreat, you now look like you have been defeated. And the Russians look like they have been defeated and they are on the run. And that is bad, bad, bad for Russian propaganda. All right. Let's quickly mention one other story, which is this uh, this. The statement from uh, Russian oligarch and uh, Nazi criminal uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, remember, Prigozhin is, of course, the uh, infamous founder of the Wagner neo-Nazi mercenary outfit. Uh, he's made a statement uh, in recent days about Russia continuing to meddle in U.S. elections, that they've done it before and that they'll do it again and that this is what we do and we'll do it in our way and this and that. And I mean, this was widely reported. And I think the most salient point of all here is that this is a maneuver for Trump. I mean, again, people need to understand how directly this is connected to U.S. politics. It is. okay. this is designed to bolster Trump and the far right, especially in regard to the idea of fraudulent election results in the United States. The Russians may not even be able to meddle in the elections the way they did in 2016 anymore, given the sort of uh, uh, public nature of what happened and the fact that the U.S. intelligence uh, world is very much watching all of those things now. So it's unlikely the Russians can directly uh, influence any real outcomes. But 
by injecting that level of uh, that, that talking point that then gives the paranoid, especially those on the right who keep talking about elections being stolen and all of this other stuff. I mean, this gives them their ammunition so that no matter what the results in the elections, they can be disputed and challenged and they can point to things like Prigozhin saying Russia will meddle the elections. It is designed to give talking points and ammunition to the far right, because that is what the Russians peddle, not only in the United States, but globally. Okay, please be aware of how directly connected to U.S. politics all of this is. And again, I make the same prediction that I have made, I don't know, many times before. And I've done it in videos here. I've done it in private conversations and, uh, you know, whatever, that Putin miscalculated. He blundered badly. He miscalculated how the war would go. He has sort of miscalculated how to prosecute this war and all of the rest of that. However, Putin also knows that he can play for time because an election in the United States is coming and that election will undoubtedly include Trump and that chaos alone can fundamentally alter the situation for the Russians vis-a-vis Ukraine. That is how Putin is thinking now and we need to pay attention to all of the political news and all of the rhetoric that comes out of Russia because it is single-minded in its focus to oust Biden and to put the Republicans back into office. That's what the Russians want because they know, look, look at Tucker Carlson's talking points and you could see it perfectly. Okay. So much more to say, but I would just say that you got to go over to the Patreon. I'll have another video up there shortly about some of the financial side of this, how the Russians are going about it. And also, isn't it interesting? We still haven't heard a word about what happened to the Nord Stream pipeline. I think with every day that passes and with every refusal from European governments to make public any of this evidence, it increasingly points to the United States having been behind uh, the sabotage and the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline. We don't know definitively, but again, the lack of information and the lack of transparency from the European countries does seem to indicate something extremely sensitive and extremely embarrassing. And it's hard for me to believe that if it was the Russians, that it wouldn't be publicized all over every newspaper and every media outlet all over Europe. But instead, the story's gone quiet. And that certainly seems to point the finger at the United States. All right. So much more. I'll have to leave it there. Patreon.com forward slash Eric Drates or counterpunch.org. Get a subscription to Counterpunch Plus. Do the right thing. Keep listening to me. I'll talk to you next time.